This is Ham College, Episode 72. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. ICOM's IC705 gives hours of fun and enjoyment working your favorite bands. Happy 2021 from ICOM. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another exciting class of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And we've got, well, we always have a different group of questions every time. That's just kind of like the point of it. There is no review. You're on your own to do the reviewing. But we have a a number of topics to cover tonight. First up, though, uh, Dean, how is 2021 for you so far? You know, it it looks a lot like uh, 2020 so far, but it's going to be better. Um, But it just hasn't really turned around just so much yet. Uh, More like, uh, what would this be, like December the 39th of 2020? Close, yeah. More, More what it feels like. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I think it will turn around, and, you know, it may take yeah. just a few months, but, yeah, things are are looking up as as far as the lockdowns and all of this stuff. So really oh, yeah. looking forward to that. What uh, Mind, yeah, I'll have to agree. Same thing, except, you know, the last week of 2020, I had a lot of issues happen at work all at once. I'm still sorting through those. Uh yeah, I, I don't know why that happens to me every year about that time. Just things decide to fail. And they're, oh, yeah. They're, it's no easy things. It's always things that are going to take an extra amount of time to solve. So uh, I yeah. guess I should be used to that. What did we talk about last month? Uh, last month? So much has happened since then. Um, but I think we talked about uh, contesting, DXing, and some other stuff. Like remote operation tips and the Cabrillo format and QSLing and yeah, RF. Yeah, log formats, that's right. Yeah, RF net. Yeah, you're right. Connected. Yeah. Well, you just kind of refreshed my memory there. Well, so, I'm glad I could help. Well, what are we going to talk about this month? Uh, this month we're going to talk about uh, um, meteor scatter, uh, EME, Earth, Moon, Earth stuff, uh, some digi- little bit of digital stuff, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, APRS, we're going to talk about VHF and UHF digital modes and procedures. You know, we've already talked about uh, a lot of the HF digital modes in an earlier episode, I was surprised that VHF and UHF modes would would be on the extra exam, but yeah, this still digs into them a little bit deeper though than than maybe you normally would. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting that they're on the extra when uh, pretty much anybody can use those. That's licensed. True. Well, you know, anytime we're doing a live stream, we've also got a chat going on at the same time. You can join all our rowdy friends in there, amateurlogic.tv slash chat. Yep, and if you're watching the live stream and you're not in the chat room, you're missing half the fun. It's up to you to decide which half. There you go, and that's that's something you can only do yourself. Yep, that is true. Well, I have a topic to discuss here that it's something happened with the FCC a few months back, and it kind of got buried. Uh, some of you may remember this. 
I don't think it made the news as big as the increase in license fees, which, by the way, instead of the $50 that they were initially proposing, I think it's at $35 now. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something to look forward to. But this is from the FCC's report and order adopted on September the 16th of last year. The FCC had been talking about finalizing their rules on uh, the electronic-only ULS and ASR systems to reduce the paperwork created. And, yeah, they've gone ahead and... And pretty much it hadn't taken effect yet. It's going to take effect, I believe they said, in June or July of this year. So you probably want to be aware of this. The first thing they're doing is they're removing the remaining exemptions to mandatory electronic filing in ULS and require that electronic filing um, in in both the ULS and ASR systems. Which do we use here for a ham radio, your your average licensee? Uh, ULS. ULS. Yeah. I actually went on there and uh, went ahead and attached an email address to mine and so I could get notifications. So I need to do my wife's because I manage her, her ticket as well. Yeah, I meant uh, to, to, to check mine today and see... I, I may have already done that, but I don't know for certain. I do need to go double-check that, and everyone does. Uh, They're mandating that all uh, filing is done electronically, no more paper filing for all wireless radio services. So it's not just ham radio. And what that means is licensees in the amateur radio service may no longer mail an application for any purpose to the FCC, all applications preferring to amateur radio licenses must be submitted electronically, online, or through a VEC. VEs and VECs might see a, a slight increase in applications for renewals and administrative yeah. updates, but uh, they're thinking it won't be a tremendous amount. There are some people that just won't do the electronic filing themselves and will we'll want to yeah. use them. I think, I think they said they estimated it might be, if it were distributed evenly, that it might be like seven extra per month. Uh, That's, yeah. Of course, we don't know, but we'll, well see. If it, it, and it won't be distributed evenly. No. Uh, some may never, True. hardly ever see any more, and then some may get in more of an influx, but. Yeah, and, and by the way, this information I've got here came from the Laurel VEC team. Uh, second, they're going to require electronic filing of all pleadings related to wireless radio service licenses and applications in these systems and require electronic service where service of such pleadings is required. That means uh, if, say, uh, you've got a notice of violation you're going to have to respond to that electronically. You can't, it won't be mailed anymore. So what else here? They're going to require the licensees notify the commission within 30 days of updating an email address of record. You know, Mm -hmm. that's just like updating your address. You're required to keep your address current with FCC, and you'll do this through uh, ULS you got to keep that email address up, too, so yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, applicants and licensees and amateur radio service must provide an email address to the FCC. No choice on that. If, even if you don't own a computer, you're going to need to come up with an email address. You can probably find someone to help you with that. That, that shouldn't be a problem. I would think yeah. anyone watching this, though, probably... Um, has access to a computer, but yeah, you know, if you don't find a friend, Elmer or a VE, to help you with that, the fact that applicants, licensees uh, provide a bogus email 
or an out-of-date email address on file with the FCC. The FCC says that's not their problem. Yeah. So, yeah, you better better keep it current. Uh, fourth, they're shifting from the U.S. Postal Service to electronic delivery of correspondence generated uh, to applicants, licensees, and registrants in the wireless radio service. So that means that the FCC is no longer going to mail correspondence to you. Um, and they anything that they need to communicate about with you, they're going to do it through the email address you provide. And also, you will no longer be able to request a hard copy of documents from the FCC. You know, you they had already gone to electronic uh, issuing of licenses, but you could ask for a printed copy. Yeah, not going to be able to do that once this goes yep. into effect later this year. I understand. It's all about uh, saving money and cutting down on the administration and demand power and stuff like that. And I'm all for that. But it's going to be kind of weird for some of the guys that just are flat aren't computer users at all. Well. That's kind of my thought. Well, I'm afraid on we're going to probably lose some people, a few people from that, maybe. I don't know. I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, that's possible. I I mean, I can see their point in doing it, but I'll agree with you. You know, some of the uh, older hams or hams that just, you know, don't have anything to do with computers are, are uh, yeah, it's going to be a little issue for them. So Yeah. Now, I might, I might, have this part mistaken, but I think they said you can go to your VE, uh, your VEC, and uh, and get them and get them to submit the stuff for you. I think uh, so. If you don't have, well, you you need an email address. Anybody can set, help you set up a Gmail mm-hmm. or something free like that. And uh, if you don't use computer, I think you can go. I'm sure somebody would be glad to help you. Heck, I'd I'd help with some if I can. You know, most people would be willing to help you. I'm sure there's a number around you somewhere that'll be glad to help you if, yeah. if you're not a computer user. I, I would recommend that, you know, your email address right now may be with your ISP like Comcast or AT&T or, or whoever your ISP is. I think probably it would be a good idea. If you got an email address with Gmail or with uh, Outlook or Hotmail or, you know, one of these services that's not tied to your ISP. Uh-huh. So if you change Internet service providers, you still got access to your email. And Yeah, that's why I quit yeah. using my ISP accounts that were they were giving me. I don't get one now from the new one, uh, but I quit doing that years ago and just used Gmails for everything. Their yeah. spam filtering is better, and you know they're going to be there. Yeah. So, there you go. Uh, new changes coming up real soon here, and uh, require your attention now. So, uh, go log into the ULS and check out to make sure you've got an email address on file and that everything's current in there. Yep. Okay. Uh, sure. You ready to get into the questions tonight? I think I'm about as ready as I'm going to get. Well, I, why don't you ask me the first one? We'll just we'll just do it that way tonight. Okay. Oh, I, you want to see it? Well, I can dig out my paperwork with it. Well, I'll let you see it. Okay. The rest of the people may want to see it, too. Good point. Which of the following digital modes is designed for media or scatter communications? A, WSPR. B, MSK-144. C, Hellschreiber. Or D, APRS. Hmm, Which of the following digital modes is... Designed for a meteor scatter. Whisper. No, I've done whisper before, and I know that's designed 
to be able to check propagation on the globe and yeah. you know it's it's really cool the way that whisper works and that's mm-hmm. wspr if you haven't checked that out go check it out i've i need to set mine back up here and run it some yeah. again i uh, run it a fair amount back here yeah off my dnc pie or my root pie rather D A P R S. That um, that's like packet, you know. Well, all of these are VHF and UHF modes, but you know that's um, positioning reports. Like you know, maybe you're running APRS in your vehicle, and uh, people can watch and see where you're traveling or see where you're located, and uh, possibly some other information pass that way, little short messages. That's not designed for meteor scatter. That's for, I would say, pretty much local type of communications or at least, you know, earthbound. Hell Scriber. Yeah, I don't think... That, that mode has been around a while. I don't think it was for Meteor Scatter, but that MSK-144. Hmm, kind of sounds like maybe Meteor Scatter. Uh-huh, that's what I was noticing. The there. Although I'm not that familiar with that one. I'm not either. But I'm going to go with that one. I'm going to say it is B, MSK-144. Just about everyone in the chat room is saying B. What was your purpose of choosing that one? Because the other ones didn't seem like a good fit? Yeah, uh, because I I believe, I, well, I know what Whisper is, and I know what APRS is. And Hellscriber, I think I've actually seen that used uh, for QSOs before that I know weren't meteor scatters, so... That kind of narrows it down, and then the abbreviation uh, or the letters there sound a little bit like it. So I'm going to go with that. Bam. Nice job. That's Wait, close enough. Yeah, that's about, uh, that's about as close as we're ever going to get on that. <laughs> yeah, for about another year. <laughs> True. Uh, maybe not that long. I just wanted to show you this is what MSK-144 looks like. You may be asking yourself, what does it sound like? Go ahead, ask yourself, what does it sound like? I was just asking myself that. So, I wonder what that sounds like. Oh. So now you know. It sounds a lot like paging in Intermod. It does. I thought it was a uh, computer got stuck in a loop. Or something. Remember when pagers used to be big you and you ride downtown with your two-meter rig and you'd hear that? I remember that very well and used to hear a lot of that. So if, High street. If you hear that sound and you know you're not getting intermod from a pager, it's probably somebody doing meteor scatter. MSK-144. We were wondering what that was. No, it doesn't stand for meteor scatter. It stands well, for... a good opportunity. Minimum shift keying, FSK signals. It's used for meteor scatter contacts. It transmits 144-bit long packets at a baud rate of 2,000 BPS using frequencies of 1,000 and 2,000 hertz. MSK-144 signals can be decoded when signal-to-noise ratios are as low as minus 8 dB. It's Part of the WSJT-X suite developed by Joe Taylor, K1JT, and others. Uh, Since public introduction in the summer of 2016, MSK-144 has become the worldwide mode of choice for amateur media scatter contacts. So, that's more than I knew about that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Taylor, he's done a lot of good, cool stuff for for the hobby. Oh, yeah. Him and, and all the folks who work with him on those projects, you know. 
Mm -hmm. Give some credit to some of the others too, but absolutely, um, you know, because that's a lot of work, man, to to pull off these. Oh bugs. yeah, and they're not like they're copying something that's, you know, it's groundbreaking stuff. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's very cool. The digital modes, you know, I've always said I wanted to get into them a little bit more, and I actually have. Uh, I mentioned it on my segment, uh, several of my segments, but I have. They're, they're fun. Uh, it's not the same as doing uh, phone, uh, but still, it's still a good time. It's oh yeah, something different, kind of, you know, do different things. Yeah, I haven't done any digital lately. I need to get back on it because if. And it's especially good for people who don't like to talk, maybe got a little mic fright. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody knows what you sound like on digital. Which of the following is a good technique for making meteor scatter contacts? Is it A, a 15-second time transmission sequence with stations alternating based on location? Mm. B, use of special digital modes. C, short transmissions with rapidly repeated call signs and signal reports. Ooh, or D, all these choices are correct. Hmm. Which of the following is a good technique for making meteor scatter contacts? 15 second transmission sequences, stations alternating. A seems plausible. Use of special digital modes. That would be that MSK forty one forty four. That's kind of that's a special digital mode in my definition. C short transmissions with rapidly repeating call signs and signal reports. I'm sure you'd want short transmissions. The top one says fifteen. I think it's going to be D. All these choices are correct. I, I think you may be on to something there. I know at least two of those. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I know I know two of them are. The C seems to make sense to me, too, because it almost falls up under A. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. it's going to be D. All of them are cor correct. Well, all of them in the chat room who ventured to guess said that it was D. Well, must be right, then. There you go. All right. Congrats. We almost nailed that one. We're getting better at it. Not good, just better. Which of the following digital modes is especially useful for EME or Earth Moon Earth communications? A. MSK 144. B. Pactor 3. C. Olivia. Or D. JT 65. I actually, I actually think I know this one. Which of the following digital modes is especially useful for EME communications? Well, we know MSK-144, what that is now, and that's for meteor scatter. Pactor, I'm thinking that's a really old mode there. I don't know about Pactor 3, but it seems like years ago I ran Pactor, you know, uh, doing some testing with a friend with my TNC. Olivia? Yeah. I've never heard of that one. I've heard of it. It may be legit, but I, I couldn't prove it. Yeah, I think it's used uh, terrestrial. Or JT-65. And I don't think JT-65 was really designed f specifically for EME because... Folks use it for a lot of different things. But I think it would work really well because you're talking about just a tiny signal there. And JT-65 is pretty robust. It is slow. But I think it, it might be good for EME. Yeah, well, it works in such a weak signal. You can't even hardly hear it, and it still works. Exactly. Which I think you're dealing with if you're trying to do EME. Huh. Yeah, I'm going to go with D, JT65. Chat room's all over that I think that that's one. a good choice. Yeah. Except mm, Dave. Most of them said D. 
Dave said twisted pair, but you know that wasn't one of the answers, or I would have chosen. Jeff that. says Olivia's coming back, but I didn't even know she left. I didn't either. Well, let's see. And it is JT sixty five. That's what it would look like. Looks like a camshaft. You know, that's kind of what I thought when I saw it too. You might ask yourself, what might you ask yourself about this? That you, uh, I don't know. I haven't really asked myself anything. Well, you might wonder, what does this sound like if you were to hear it on the air? Well, that's kind of what I was thinking next. I don't think I've ever worked JT65. I need to get on that and and the other one that I almost am afraid to mention because it's sort of like a uh, religious argument there. Oh, uh, the F FT8, I'll go ahead yeah. and say it. I'll be that guy. Okay. Well, I've I, done it a few times. It's it's okay. It's it's different. JT-65 is an amateur radio QSO communications protocol. You know why they call it 65? No idea. It uses 65 different tones. Each transmission begins with time equals one second after the start of a UTC minute and finishes at 47.8 seconds. So your clock has got to be synchronized for that to work out correctly. Each transmission must begin within the first four seconds of the minute to be decoded. Multiple stations transmit on the same carrier using both FDM and TDM methods. And initiating stations choose either the even or odd minute to transmit and responding stations transmit on the opposite minute. What technology is used to track in real time balloons that carry amateur radio transmitters? Is it A, ultrasonics? B, bandwidth compressed Loran? C, APRS? Or D, Doppler shift of beacon signals? Well, it's not A. It's, it's not D. I'm mis- I, and it's not B. It's, it's going to be C. I, and I know that because we've covered several balloon uh, launches in the past, and I, I follow some of the balloons when they're launching. I actually try to track them on APRS.FI. Uh, Whisper is, is used a lot now with those as well, but that's not one of the options. But APRS is most common. That's what they're all saying over in the chat room. I'll have to agree if it can't be ultrasonics, which, no, it's definitely not. <laughs> it's uh, it's APRS. Yeah, there you go. Guess what that is? Well, I, I would think that looks, that looks just like an APRS packet to me. Well, it kind of does, doesn't it, if you were viewing it on you a... You know, the natural thing is I kind of wonder what one sounds like after I see it. I've gotten pretty good at duplicating those sounds here. Boy, that was a long packet transmission there. It was. It's used for real-time data. Uh, data can include uh, objects like global positioning systems, GPS coordinates, weather station telemetry, text messages, announcements, queries, and other telemetry. APRS data can be displayed on a map which can show station objects, tracks of moving objects, weather stations, search and rescue data, and direction finding data. In the mood for hot coffee? When you are, nothing else will satisfy. Coffee has a flavor, an aroma, a deep down satisfying goodness all its own. And our coffee has something extra, the care with which we brew and serve it. You'll enjoy the show more while you're enjoying steaming hot coffee. Come and get yours now. Happy 2021 from ICOM. ICOM's IC705 gives hours of fun and enjoyment working your favorite bands. The IC705 is a perfect sidekick for hams that like to enjoy what both the great indoors and outdoors have to offer. 
It's the perfect QRP companion. Base station features and functionalities at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at just over 2 pounds with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall. 5 watts with the BP272 battery pack or 10 watts with external 13.8 volt DC. Single sideband CW, AM, FM as well as full D-Star functions. Micro USB connector, Bluetooth and wireless LAN. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger. Micro SD card slot. HM243 speaker microphone, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the now available optional LC192 backpack with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or a day in the park. Other available accessories include the AL705 QRP portable magnetic antenna, BP272 standard battery pack, or BP307 lithium ion battery pack, micro USB to micro USB cable, USB type C to micro USB cable, DC power cable, compact lapel PTT microphone with earphone, MBF705 desktop tray. And coming soon, the AH705 antenna tuner. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Tracy to kids. Tracy to kids. Come in, kids. Come in, kids. It's here at last, the new Dick Tracy two-way wrist radio that keeps you in constant touch with your buddies. Easy to work. Up antenna, switch on, press talk button, and you broadcast from room to room and even house to house. No wires needed, yet voices travel back and forth. Radio on the open road from one bike to another or when out hiking. Dad, Dad, I found a bear's cave. Be right down, son. A powerful, fully transistorized Dick Tracy two-way wrist radio is a real electronic instrument. Make sure all the fellows get their A-OK -okay Dick Tracy wrist radio so they can keep in touch. Over and out. The one and only Dick Tracy wrist radio wherever American toys are sold. What is one advantage of the JT65 mode? A, it uses only a 65 hertz bandwidth. B, the ability to decode signals which have a very low signal-to-noise ratio. C, easily copied by ear if necessary. Or D, permits fast scan TV transmissions over narrow bandwidth. Well, that would be nice. Yeah. What is one advantage of the JT65 mode? Well, I'm going to say right off, it's not fast scan TV. I think everyone knows that. Yeah. C, easily copied by ear if necessary. I don't know. What I heard a while ago is I was having a little trouble decoding by ear. Yeah, a little bit. And so it's not C. I, I'm pretty sure it's not A because we know the 65 means that it's using 65 tones. So the ability to decode signals which have a very low signal-to-noise ratio, yeah, we... We already knew that was the answer because sometimes that signal is so low that you can't even really hear it, and yet it's getting decoded. So that's got to be it. The chat room is saying it's B. And so, yeah, well, there it is. It is B. It's actually it's pretty amazing how uh, how weak of a signal that will still work with. It is really is so all of that i mean i don't see how well you you let real smart guys figure it out and use their <laughs> software that's mm -hmm. that's how i do it 
Works for me, too. Which of the following describes a method of establishing EME contacts? A, time synchronous transmissions alternately from each station. Uh, B, storing and forwarding digital messages. C, judging optimum transmission times by monitoring beacons reflected from the moon. D, High-speed CW identification to avoid fading. Which of the following describes a method of establishing EME contacts, which is Earth, Moon, Earth, which means bouncing your signal off the moon, which is really cool stuff. I've never tried anything like that because I don't have the gear for it. But um, uh, It's not going to be high-speed CW to avoid fading. Judging optimum transmission times by monitoring beacons. I don't think we got anything oh, reflected from the moon. No. I don't think so. Story and forwarding is not it. It's got to be a time synchronous transmissions alternately from each station. So you're saying so, you can't store huh? a message on the moon? And forward it. I don't think so. Yeah. This is not anybody up there to copy it. Good point. And the, the aliens, that's a whole different language. True. Well, the chat room's all saying, hey, I'm going to have to agree with you. I think it's A as well. Yeah, it's got to be. There you go. That is that is cool stuff though, bouncing your signal off the moon and uh, somebody back here on Earth listening to it. It but, is. Uh, takes some specialized gear to pull that off though, which I don't have. Yeah, you need some pretty high gain antennas to pull that off. Although it's easier now with JT sixty five than than it was. E M E. It presents. Significant challenges to amateur operators interested in weak signal communications. EME provides the longest communications path any two stations on Earth can use. Most EME communications are on 2 meters, 70 centimeters, or the 23 centimeter bands. Common modulation modes are CW with Morse code, digital JT65, and when the link budget allows, voice. Recent advances in digital signal processing have allowed EME low data rate contacts to take place with powers of 100 watt and a single Yagi antenna. Wow, so JT65 has kind of lowered the requirements there a little bit on your Earth station. Well, Tommy, what do you say we give away an ICOM t shirt and hat? That's a good idea. I just so happened to have found one just a few moments ago. That is a nice uh, ICOM ham crew t-shirt. You'll look just as good when you leave the ham fest as you did when you got there. And I found a nice matching cap that goes with it quite well. That does goes match. With it. Goes with anything, actually. Yeah. So I think uh, somebody would probably love to get these. I think so. Uh, the way that you enter is you just send us an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv and you have to have a name and an email address. Don't have to have a call sign. And you can put whatever you want in the email. You can give us a longer one or or you can just say hello and that's it. Um, no. No special requirements there, except that you got an email address and a name. And the guy that actually won this time around, because we draw a random number, and then uh, that person is the one who wins this time around, it is John Rager, K9DRS. And John said, oh. good show. Hope to win the T-shirt. So congratulations, John. You did win the T-shirt. And the hat. DRS? I don't see him in the chat room, but congratulations, John. Yeah. 
We'll look like twins at the ham fest if we ever get to go back to one. Or we will be back at one. Yeah. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Could happen. Sooner, I hope. Yeah. Could ha I'm thinking it will happen at some point this year. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Okay. Well, congratulations. If, uh, if you want to enter for next month's contest, if you entered in the previous one, the queue just got cleared out, so you need to resend your email in for the next draw, next month's drawing, so you can uh, be in, in it to win it. What digital protocol is used by APRS? A. Pactor. B. 802.11. C. AX.25. Or D. Amtor. What digital protocol is used by APRS? Hmm, Pactor. Yeah, I know that's not it. And it's not Amtor. And it's not 802.11 Wi Fi. It's Packet. They use Packet to do APRS with. And I happen to know that is AX.25. Two five, or AX twenty five. Yeah. Uh, just about everyone said AX twenty five in the chat room there. So let's see. And it is. What type of packet frame is used to transmit APRS beacon data? Is it A unnumbered information? Uh, B disconnect. C acknowledgement. Or D, connect. Well, what type of packet frame is used to transmit beacon data? It's not going to be connect or disconnect. So that's, I'm saying that is not B or C. And it's not an acknowledgement because once you send something, the act comes back uh, saying that you got it. Just a beacon goes out for anybody to hear. So based off of that deduction, I would say the letter is, or the answer is A, unnumbered information. It's not a beacon data is not going to be a connect or a disconnect or an acknowledgement. That's stuff that you would get if you were going to connect to somebody to send messages or chat or something like that. Yeah. Beacons are not for that. Yeah. So that, that only leaves A. I'll agree with you. And it is. Hey, unnumbered information. That's what they were all saying over in the chat room. What type of modulation is used for JT65 contacts? A, multi-tone AFSK. Hmm. B, PSK. C, RTTY. Or D, IEEE 802.11. Well, we can... We can go through these pretty quick and rule out the bad ones. It's not D. 802.11 is Wi-Fi. Yeah, we know it's not that. Now, we know it's not RIDI either because, well, it's, it's just not. You know, RIDI is another mode. PSK is also a different mode. But we know there's multiple tones in JT65, and it is AFSK. It's A. That's what Gotta I'm saying. Be. And that's Where, what, where's a meal when you needed him? I, I want him to read that D one. I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never knew what what that was for, and now I do. <laughs> that's that had to come from Louisiana. Must have. <laughs> Multitone AFSK. Okay. Way to go. We've got more yet. But wait, there's more. Yep. How can an APRS station be used to help support a public service communication activity? Is it A, an APRS station with an emergency medical technician can automatically transmit medical data to the nearest hospital? B, APRS stations with general personnel scanners 
can automatically relay the participant number, numbers, and time they pass the checkpoints. C, an APRS station with a global positioning system unit, can automatically transmit information to show a mobile station's position during the event. For D, all of these choices are correct. And these are not, D is not the answer. All these choices are definitely not correct. That I'm sure of. Okay. Explain. Um, pardon? Explain. Do some explaining? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go through the others. Uh, APR station with an emergency medical technician can automatically transmit medical data to the nearest hospital. That it, APRS doesn't work like that. Uh, in one of the earlier questions, uh, the, the answer had something about uh, sending, that it sends uh, weather telemetry, uh, positioning data, and messaging. And there might have been one more in there, but those are the ones that come to, to mind. Um, so automatically sending medical data to the hospital is not used for that. It's not designed for it. Uh, personnel scanners to automatically relay the participant numbers. That's not, it's not used for that either. It's C, an APRS station with a global positioning system unit can automatically transmit information to show mobile stations position during the event. And that's the, that's what most people use it for. Um, you can go to APRS.FI website and see most of the ones that are out in the whole world right now where they where they are and and stuff like that and actually see their packets yeah so i'm sure c is the correct answer mm, that's what most of them are saying in the chat room but not everyone so let's see oh it is c okay Well, I was going to feel pretty bad if it wasn't. <laughs> well, you know, we're long <laughs> overdue for a buzzer. Do what now? I say we are long overdue for a buzzer. Yeah, we are. But this is one I actually felt like I knew right off the bat yeah. when it came up. But that, that doesn't mean some of that other stuff, you know, anything can happen. And but as, I'm pretty sure I was right on that one. As I say that. I realize there's only one question left tonight, and I'm the one who's got to answer it. So, yeah. ah, so we are overdue for some buzzer action. Which of the following data are used by APRS network to communicate station location? A. Polar coordinates. B. Time and frequency. C. Radio direction finding spectrum analysis. Or D, latitude and longitude. Well. I don't think we got much chance of a buzzer tonight. Yeah. I think most people will probably get that one right, right there. Not polar coordinates, time and frequency, radio direction finding spectrum analysis, which I'm not sure if that's a thing or not. Uh, the way it's termed out there. But I do know it's uh, latitude and longitude. So it it's D. Everyone's saying D in the chat room. There you go. You mean it's not radio direction finding spectrum analysis? No, nope, it's not that either. Not that? Yep. <laughs> okay, well... We are going to be back in just a moment. That's all the questions tonight, but we got one other thing we wanted to mention. Around the 15th of each month, it's Amateur Radio's original and longest-running video podcast, AmateurLogic.tv, with hosts George Thomas, Tommy Martin, and Emil Diodine. Roughly, here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. We're in the antenna switching matrix, 
Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas. I personally am so thrilled that George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. Yeah, what about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tuning my amplifier and oh, I lost power in the shack and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. that explains a lot. Yeah, we can take this and put it over inside our box. It's flush to the bottom. If we were to rotate, we can see that thing goes all the way through. So we'll have a hole in the bottom. Here's what it looks like after I've got them all soldered together and the heat shrinked up. Okay, let's give it a try and see how it worked out. So there you have it, the hula loop. No, you can't null out the dogs barking. I have two thin film solar cells to run this. Looks like a little mini weather satellite, actually. And uh, I'm using a guitar string for the antennas. I particularly like that last one there. $29.99, you can get a 50-foot garden hose extension cord combo. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Do not get cord wet. Now, most of these J-poles are built with metal elements or tubing. Uh, the reason I chose wire for this one is the length of this particular one. So I wanted to hang it from the tree so I can hoist it up there. Yeah. Go fishing. Well, we, we couldn't find the reel. <laughs> yeah. Is that what yeah. that is? All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. <laughs> get you every time. Now, that was my Yagi antenna right there. That did look like your Yagi antenna. Yeah. Maybe well, you try that. One other thing we wanted to mention tonight, I got an email here from our friend Jay Melnick, the Radio Society of Tucson. That's at k7rst.org is going to be offering amateur radio license exams on Monday, January the 11th at 7 p.m. at Biscuits Country Cafe, which is located at 7026 East Broadway. So if you are in the Tucson area and you're looking to get licensed or upgrade your license, or you just like taking exams, well, go to k7rst.org. You can get the full exam schedule for the year right there. And Monday the 11th at 7 p.m. is their next testing session. And Tommy, might I say that that is a mighty sporting-looking shirt that you are wearing tonight? It, it is. This, uh, this one's got my call sign on the back of it. Hmm. I think. I guess I... Yeah, you can see it. I'm, I'm at... A... High College tonight. You're what? I'm at High College. <laughs> <laughs> High College. College. Oh, yeah. Now, these, and, and mine has my call sign, too. And these were custom manufactured by Mr. and Mrs. VE3MIC. Yeah. And... And, uh... We're we're wearing them tonight because they're they're awesome shirts. They're great, but it's usually pretty warm around here, and it's actually a pretty good cold uh, snap going on outside tonight. So, decided to take advantage of them while we can. It is, and yeah, you're right. There's not a lot of um, a lot of days that we could wear these during the show, but certainly tonight. So yeah. You know, I don't think that Mike is is going to want to manufacture one of these shirts for everybody who wants one. But if if you did need a ham college sweatshirt or even a t-shirt, wh what do you think? Where could a fella get one or a lady? Well, you know, if I were going to get one, I would go to amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com and get one there. You can get T-shirts, uh, golf shirts, caps, cups, hoodies, backpacks, mugs, a lot of different things there. So uh, Amateur Logic and Ham College swag on there. So both flavors for, for your two favorite uh, video podcasts. There you go. So go check it out. 
You can get one of these too. Doesn't come with the tea bag though. No, but I'll send you mine if you really want one. I've already drank mine. That's okay. I've got one. So, let's see. Where are we? Well, I think there's a couple of things we want to mention. You know, not this this week, not this past Tuesday, but the Tuesday before, during our sound check net, you mentioned that we would uh, we would be shutting it down for a while, but all of that mm-hmm. changed, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Uh, it was kind of a lot to monitor every every week and do it every week, and uh, but yeah, it did. We uh, Tom WA two IVD. He's in the chat room. He's gonna do it. He actually did the one this week, and uh, Amanda and Jeff from. Uh, Ham Nation, they're going to do a week, and then we're splitting up the other week, so we managed to keep it going. Um, so anyway, come check us out on the, or come check out, or get checked in, rather. That's probably a better way to, uh, to put it, on the Amateur Logic Soundcheck Net. Every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock Central, or 0, 200 UTC. Uh, it's a very well-connected net. As you can see, we've got a lot of different modes and a lot of different connections that you can get uh, get in there on. And uh, this is one of the nets that we do encourage multiple check-ins if you, as long as you're using a different mode each time. So it's a lot of fun. We usually have a question, some little fun little question uh, to share a little bit about your station or about yourself or whatever, whatever the topic of the evening is. And um, people have been really enjoying it. So we luckily, thanks to those folks, uh, kind of good folks, they. Uh, stepped up to help and we're able to keep it going for a while longer so and we we really appreciate that this past week we had uh tom applenack called it yeah wa2 ivd Mm -hmm. he did a real good job too yeah so like a pro yeah and the question he had was pretty good too you know we asked a question during that net each night and his question, I don't remember the exact wordings, but basically, what what projects do you have going for this year? It's interesting to hear what people were, were planning on doing this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Some of the answers were related to around the net, so doing other digital modes and stuff like that. So it's, it's a lot of fun. If, if you're free on Tuesday night, uh, come check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, you can actually, hear, if you get to where you can't transmit, you can actually hear it on YouTube. Uh, most of them, we're streaming the audio on YouTube as well. Um, but anyway, it's it's a lot of fun. Yep. And during the month, if you'd like to catch up and see what everybody's up to, not just us, but uh, some of our friends as well, you can do it socially. Facebook.com slash groups slash ham college or slash amateur logic. Yep. Uh, we're on Twitter at ham college. Uh, we got also have at ham at amateur logic. And groups. And who else? Oh, go ahead. You can do this one. And groups.io slash G slash amateur logic. You can catch up with us uh, and find out when the next episode's going to be of Ham College or Amateur Logic. And and keep in the loop right there. You'll also find out what projects people are working on that they want to share with the group. And just some basic good tips and techniques in there from time to time. So check them out. Yeah, as the the group site, I was going to mention the group site is a good place to get notifications for the soundcheck net or reminders. So if you uh, you know, if you don't do the rest of the social media stuff, that's one that you're not going to get just a lot of uh, a lot of spam from. No spam, really. Just a few messages, uh, about maybe two two or three a week. Usually they come out, and then whenever showtime is, we send reminders for that. So. But it's, it's been a good mechanism to get the word out. So, anyway, check it out. if uh, That way you can stay up to date. 
Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. 73. 73. Coffee break's over? Coffee break is over.